So the superluminal family of observers is ruled out from special relativity based on an additional postulate. And there are good reasons to do so, because the presence of those superluminal observers leads to serious problems with causality. But... Hello and welcome to the seventh episode of my online course on special relativity. My name is Andrzej Dragan. I'm a professor of theoretical physics at the University of Warsaw and National University of Singapore. And so far, we have developed enough basic knowledge of relativity to be able to understand that all this time we were wrong about one important detail. So the plan for today is to go all the way back to the starting point and rethink everything we thought we knew about relativity. <laughs> Consider an inertial observer that uses unprimed coordinates x and t, and another one in relative motion that uses primed coordinates x prime and t prime. Our goal will be to determine the transformation formulas between those two coordinate systems, provided that one of them is moving with some relative velocity v. The only thing we want to assume is the Galilean principle of relativity, which states that all inertial frames of reference are completely equivalent. And from this assumption, one conclusion follows immediately. Unknown transformation formulas have to be linear functions of coordinates. And that's because linear transformations are the only ones that do not prefer any point in space-time. So if I shift the origin of the frame of reference, the transformation formulas should not change. And for the same reason, a linear function is the only function that does not prefer any point in its domain. So our transformation formulas have two unknown coefficients, a and b. And those coefficients can only depend on the relative velocity between the two frames, simply because there is nothing else to be dependent on. Now, because of the principle of relativity, we can immediately write the inverse transformation, which involves a simple sign flip of the velocity. And that's all. And now our goal is to determine the most general form of those coefficients a and b. And what we can do right away is to find the relation between those two by using the definition of the relative velocity v. So the origin of the moving frame of reference given by x prime equals to zero has to move in the other frame of reference with a constant velocity v. So it must be given by the equation x equals v times t. And if you take those two equations and plug them into the first transformation formula, we find the following relation between the coefficients b and a. And this finding allows us to rule out the unknown coefficient b from the equations, and all that will be left to determine is the unknown coefficient a. And before we proceed, let us first rearrange the equations and solve them for x prime and t prime. And now we are ready to look for the unknown coefficient a. So notice that the simplest solution to our problem corresponds to a equal to 1, which makes the transformation for time trivial. t prime simply equals to t. And in that case, x prime equals x minus v times t, which is simply a Galilean transformation. But obviously our task is to find the most general transformation formulas. And at this stage, all that we can say about the unknown coefficient a is that it has to be either a symmetric or antisymmetric function of its argument v. And the reason for this is very simple. If one of the observers chooses to flip his spatial axis x into minus x, then such operation can only introduce some sign flips in the transformation formulas. But notice that such operation also flips all the signs of velocities. And since the unknown coefficient a depends on the velocity, then that dependence can only be symmetric or antisymmetric, so that the operation only introduces some sign flips in the transformation formulas. So to find the unknown coefficient a, we will consider not two but three inertial observers. The resting one will use unprimed coordinates, x and t. The second one moving in a car will use primed coordinates, x prime and t prime. And the third one moving in a rocket will use double primed coordinates. So suppose that the car is moving with relative velocity v1 relative to the unprimed observer, and the rocket is moving relative to the car with some relative velocity v2. And our first task is to determine the transformation formulas between the resting observer and the rocket. And for that, all we have to do is just to iterate our transformation formulas 
corresponding to motion with velocity v1, followed by motion with velocity v2. And the task is pretty straightforward, and here is the result that depends on both velocities, v1 and v2. From this equation we can also determine the relative velocity between the rocket and the resting observer by checking the transformation formulas for x prime. And we see that the relative velocity v in this case is simply the ratio of the coefficient standing in front of t and the coefficient standing in front of x. And we also have to reverse the sign. So let us apply this rule to the transformation formula between the rocket and the resting observer and that leads to the following result. And notice again that if a was simply equal to 1, the result would be completely trivial and the velocities would simply add up, as we know from the non-relativistic kinematics. And now we are very close from completion of the whole derivation, because there exists another way to determine the relative velocity between the resting observer and the rocket, which is minus v. And that is by considering a composition of transformations, but in the opposite order. So we would start at the frame of the rocket and move with velocity minus v2 and then follow it with motion with velocity minus v1 that would take us to the resting frame. And all of that means that we can compute minus v by taking our formula and replacing v1 with minus v2 and vice versa. And this procedure leads to the second formula that can be now compared with the first one. And let us notice that the numerators of both expressions are the same, and the product v1 times v2 in the denominator is also the same in both expressions. The only difference between those expressions is in the fraction in the denominator, which for the first expression depends on the velocity v1, but in the second expression depends on velocity v2. And since that fraction is some unknown function of velocity, and for two arbitrary velocities v1 and v2, that fraction has to be the same, which only means that this whole fraction has to be equal to some constant. And that constant we will denote with 1 over c squared. And this amazing derivation is practically over, because if we consider a symmetric function a of v, we can use that relation to determine a and plug it into the transformation formulas that will give us the familiar Lorentz transformations. So the amazing part of the derivation is that we did not have to assume the constancy of the speed of light. That became a conclusion of our reasoning. And all we had to assume is the Galilean principle of relativity discovered many centuries ago by Galileo himself or his parrot. Mm -hmm. So in principle, all that we have done today could already have been done many centuries ago by Galileo. This derivation was introduced by a Polish physicist, Andrzej Szymacha. Notice that the result is only valid for velocities smaller than c. And as we know, geometrically speaking, this whole transformation is simply a hyperbolic rotation of space-time. Also, we have no idea how to compute the value of the constant c. All that we know is that there exists some constant characterizing the transformation of the space-time coordinates of the unknown value. And in particular, that constant could be equal to infinity, and that would lead us to the Galilean non-relativistic version of the kinematics. Also, at this stage, somebody could notice an inconsistency between the assumptions that we have taken and the results. Because what we have assumed is that all inertial observers are equivalent to each other. But the result allows only the observers that move with velocities smaller than c. So is that not a contradiction? It would be. But there is also a second possibility that the unknown function a of v is antisymmetric. And that eventuality leads to an alternative form of the transformation formulas. And here they are. And these formulas are only valid for velocities that are larger than c. And mathematically, both families of these solutions, subluminal and superluminal, are like two sides of the same coin. <laughs>
So far we have only assumed the Galilean principle of relativity, which puts no restriction whatsoever on the possible velocities of the observers. And both of our solutions, subluminal and superluminal, are linear. They both respect the constancy of the speed of light. So in principle, any derivation of Lorentz transformations should also lead to the second superluminal branch of solutions. And if that is not the case, then either something has been overlooked or some additional limiting assumptions have been taken. And that was also the case when we derived the Lorentz transformation using the Minkowski method. And it's a good exercise to spot the exact moment at which we have excluded the superluminal branch of solutions. We should also point out that the superluminal branch has undefined sign. It's either plus or minus. And we cannot uniquely specify the sign because we cannot take the v going to zero limit, which was possible for the subluminal branch of solutions. So the choice of the sign has to be a matter of convention. And we will pick a negative sign so that the geometrical interpretation of the whole transformation is that it is also a hyperbolic rotation of space-time. However, the angle of that rotation has to be larger than 45 degrees. So the superluminal family of observers is ruled out from special relativity based on an additional postulate. And there are good reasons to do so, because the presence of those superluminal observers leads to serious problems with causality. But in 2020, together with Arthur Eckert, who is the father of quantum cryptography, we wrote a paper asking the eternal question, but what if? And we had a good reason to ask that question, because reality is fundamentally quantum. And for that reason, causality is already disturbed. So in that paper, we made the claim that there exists a fundamental connection between basic laws of quantum theory and the existence of superluminal frames of reference. The paper went totally viral. And you may think that Albert Einstein was rolling in his grave because he hated quantum theory. But this couldn't be further from the truth. Apparently, Albert Einstein is alive and well. And he even runs an official Twitter account where he tweeted about our crazy paper. So I'm going to discuss all these things in detail in further episodes. But if you're curious already, get a copy of my textbook on relativity. It's called Unusually Special Relativity. The link is in the description. But today, the show cannot go on. So do what you have to do and get out of here.